Welcome to the City Club of Eugene, January 27, 2017 program. Is Oregon low vaccination rate a public health crisis? This is the 16th program in a current programming year, 2016-2017 programming year. My name is Juan Carlos Valle, City Club President. The City Club brings together civic-minded people to make Eugene a better place to live, work, and play. We are a member-supported nonprofit. Our members have a direct access and influence to public policy by becoming a City Club member. Please join us at www.cityclubofeugene.org. Support for the City Club of Eugene is provided by members and sponsors, including Luvas and Cobb, established in 1955. Luvas and Cobb is one of the oldest and most respected law firms in Oregon. Gators Turnside in Bothra, PC, a small firm with a big heart. They continue to distinguish themselves with ex expertise, responsiveness, and integrity in their general civil practice. And KPFF, Consulting Engineering, because they provide office space for us, and also they're the world's most thoughtful professionals to engineer extraordinary places. At this time, I'd like to take a moment to say a couple of words of gratitude and remembrance to Dr. Edwin Coleman, Professor Emer Emeritus. Dr. Coleman was a mentor to many of us. And at times, he calmly and steady and sometimes affirmed, guided me through difficult conversations and into the community to become a better person. We and hopefully you too are grateful for his legacy and I thank him and his family for sharing him with the community for many, many years. Dr. Coleman's interest included African American literature, folklore music, career as a professional musician, as well as literary scholar. He is listed as who is who in the black community a moment of silence to honor him and his legacy, please. Thank you so much. Today's program is Oregon's low vaccination rate. Is it a public health issue and crisis? This program is coordinated by our very own Joel Corin. And Joel, will you come over to the podium to introduce the topic and also the speakers? Please help me welcome Joel. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Within the past month, if you read the papers, you would have seen an article, mumps cases estimated at 108 in Seattle. Uh, an article uh, within the past week that the, uh, there's a measles outbreak affecting 16 people in the small Orthodox Jewish community in Los Angeles. We will recall that in 2014, uh, 145 people in the United States, Mexico, and Canada were sickened in a measles outbreak that centered at Disneyland. In the uh, New York Times Magazine, the column, The Ethicist, my sister won't vaccinate her son, can I help him? This is obviously a topic of public interest and public involvement. We publish, we have a website at City Club and put uh, information about our programs on the website every week. This week, we have at least 13 pages of comments and questions, which is not the usual number of questions we get. Uh, you will notice that there are television cameras here. You may not have noticed that uh, we have uh, a crew from Flux Magazine, which is a, a U of O publication here, and I've uh, instructed them as how I should be described. Uh, <laughs> 
Oregon does have a very low vaccination rate. And the question we, we address today is, does that constitute a health crisis for our citizens? The speakers we have today are very impressive. We could have, I could have either given them a proper introduction, uh, outlining all the things that they've accomplished, or we could have a program. I couldn't do both. So I decided to have a brief introduction and uh, allow them to uh, speak on the topic. Patrick Ludicky, uh Dr. Ludicky, is the Chief Medical Officer for Lane County and has been in the position since 2011. He earned his medical degree at the Medical College of Wisconsin and his Master's in Public Health at the University of Utah. Uh, Ter Tricia Schroffner is a family nurse practitioner and runs the My School Health Centers in North Eugene and Churchill High Schools. She earned her bachelor's degree from Notre Dame and her uh, bachelor's and master's degree in nursing from Columbia. Paul Slovic is a professor uh, at the Department of Psychology at the U of O and president of Decision Research in Eugene. He earned, he earned his bachelor's in, in Stanford and his MA and PhD at the University of Michigan and he specializes in how and why people make decisions. Uh, Dr. Ludicky will be the first speaker. Thank you, City Club. Thank you, Joel, for the introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'm just going to dive right in, knowing that oftentimes at City Club, we're pressed for time. We want to have opportunity for as many questions as possible. So. In 2014, the state of Ohio experienced a large outbreak of mumps. That outbreak centered on the bad OSU, Ohio State University, not our OSU, uh, infected 484 persons. Interestingly, while most of, most of us think of mumps as an infection that infects the salivary glands and results in those puffy chipmunk-like cheeks, uh, it also infects other glands in the human body. Uh, two of its favorites are the ovaries and the testes. The outbreak in, in Ohio um, had 12 testicular infections and four persons with ovarian infection. And as you might imagine, on occasion, those infections will result in infertility. Uh, most of the time, however, it only infects one side, one ovary or one testes, and that might result in hyper, hy hypofertility, meaning low fertility. Um, mumps also infects the brain. It can cause meningitis, it can also cause encephalitis. And sadly, that Ohio outbreak had these serious infections as well. Thirteen Ohioans were hospitalized for their mumps infections. One was a college senior who had encephalitis and ultimately ended up with deafness. While it's uncommon, um, deafness is a, a known complication. In fact, during my childhood and before my childhood, it was the number one cause of deafness in kids, mumps, the mumps virus was. Uh, when mumps-related deafness does occur, it's typically only one ear. Occasionally, it'll be both ears. But that being said, I, I simply can't imagine being a college senior about to start my life, and now I'm faced with deafness for the rest of my life. Um, that's a tough scenario, I think. Before mumps vaccine was widely available in the U.S., um, a 10-year retrospective looking at all reported infections showed that we averaged 189,000 mumps cases per year in this country. With that large number, you might expect we would see some of those serious infections, and indeed we did. We saw, as I mentioned, um, a good number of cases of deafness, typically in one ear. Uh, we also saw infertility. We also saw several dozen, dozen deaths each year from the mumps virus, typically from encephalitis infections. After the vaccine was introduced, the number of mumps infections dropped by 99%, such that in a typical year, if there is such a thing as a typical year, um, the U.S. has only a couple hundred cases of mumps each year which makes that Ohio state outbreak, 484 cases, even all the more remarkable. So sadly, last year, 2016, was not a typical year. The USA experienced dozens of mumps outbreaks, mainly on college campuses, but also at some primary and secondary schools. Um, schools such as Harvard, Tufts, Boston University, University of Missouri, University of San Diego, and I Ohio State, um, I excuse me, Iowa State University, all experienced outbreaks. The winner, if, if there is a winner when we're talking about disease outbreaks, however, is Arkansas. They currently are in the grips of a five-month-long mumps outbreak that began in August. Um, through December 31st of last year, they've had 2,500 cases of mumps in northwest Arkansas. That includes several um, serious infections of meningitis and some cases of testicular infection. Um, they have a total of 51 middle schools, high schools, and colleges currently affected in that part of Arkansas, so, you know, a significant issue. 
So with that as a preamble, I think it's probably pretty reasonable to ask how, how can this happen? How can an infectious agent like mumps, whose numbers had been beaten back by 99% due to 40 years of vaccination efforts, how can it return with such force and such fury? And in the case of mumps, the answer really is simple. We're dropping our vaccination rates. Now, while it's true there are some infectious agents, um, like pandemic influenza virus, that can occasionally mutate and evade our very best defenses. Um, in the case of mumps, the virus, which not, doesn't mutate um, readily at all, um, failure to vaccinate is the biggest culprit. By way of example, Oregon for 2016 saw that 7% of our kindergarten students and daycare attendees received an exemption to not be vaccinated for all vaccines or for select vaccines. That's the worst rate in the country or the highest rate, depending on your point of view, I suppose. Um, if you look deeper into that immunization data, however, it's, it's really worse than that. Um, if you look down to the county level, you'll find that Lane County reliably ranks amongst the worst of Oregon's 36 counties for vaccination exemptions. Um, true, you know, over the last five years and a lot of great effort, we've gotten a little bit better. When I first moved here in 2011, we were the third worst county of 36. Now we're nine or 10 worst, but we're still amongst the worst of the worst. Now, it's also worth noting that other vaccine preventable diseases offer stories fairly similar to mumps. For example, um, polio vaccine became widely available in the late 1950s. Before that time, we averaged 16,000 permanent paralytic polio cases in this country. Now, I, you're looking at me and you see some gray hair. I'm old enough to have had several persons in my elementary school who were in braces or they had permanent limb deformities from polio. One of our presidents, President Roosevelt, had polio. Um, it was very common in prior generations. And polio, unfortunately, produces permanent paralysis. And I saw a good deal of that in my childhood. Another example is measles. In a typical year, over a course of a decade of reported data to the Centers for Disease Control, the United States had 530,000 reported measles cases. Measles, like mumps, unfortunately can infect the brain and cause encephalitis and meningitis. In a typical year back then, pre-vaccination, we'd have about 500 people die in this country from measles and somewhere around 50,000 hospitalizations from serious infections. Thankfully, uh, that doesn't happen anymore. In a typical year now, we have 50 to 60 measles cases in the entire country, not 500,000. So this all begs the question, I think, why is it that Lane County citizens are not getting vaccinated at prior rates? Um, I think it's worthwhile looking at this as perhaps two sides of a coin. If we only had a 7% roughly vaccine exemption rate, that means 93% of our kids are getting vaccinated overall. That's a pretty darn good rate. Um, that's, just, that's just kids. Um, if we look at other rates like the influenza vaccine rate in adults in this county, it's about 40%. So we have plenty of areas that are, are uh, really open for improvement. But why is it that our, our kids are increasingly not getting vaccinated? Um, we in Lane County Public Health have done two surveys over the last five years. We surveyed the lay public and we also surveyed the clinical community to get a better sense of where these challenges lie. In general, our research and research of others has shown that there are maybe seven main reasons why it is that um, persons are vaccinating at lower rates these days. I'm going to discuss them briefly and then turn the microphone over to Dr. Slovic to discuss it in deeper detail. So the first of those reasons, many people don't know these bacteria or these viruses exist anymore. If we've gone from 16,000 paralytic polio cases per year in this country to zero in the last 20 years, zero cases, a couple imported from people who might have come from Pakistan or Nigeria, countries that still have polio, but zero cases indigenous here. People aren't afraid of polio anymore. They don't think it's a risk and they typically are not having a push, um, some kind of reason to be vaccinated. Next, number two, people do not know a vaccine is recommended for their children or for themselves. And again, I mentioned influenza rates for adults, 40% of Lane County citizens are getting vaccinated. Uh, I wonder about the pneumonia vaccine, the pneumovax vaccine. That's recommended for everybody 65 and older, certain people in longer age, younger age groups who have uh, heart or lung diseases. And I bet not everybody 65 or over in this room has had that vaccine either. Plenty of room for improvement. Third reason, some people have concerns of vaccine side effects. It's almost 20 years now since the fraudulent paper was published in 1998 linking select vaccine to autism. It's been debunked since um, that particular doctor lost his medical license in the United Kingdom, and yet it's still out there churning in the social media universe. Reason number four, some have concerns about vaccine effectiveness. Um, if you just look at the mumps mentioned by Joel at the, at the outset of this, um, when we have high vaccination rates, 90%, 93%, 
Um, for vaccines that are not perfect, some people who get mumps will have been prior vaccinated. People start to wonder, hey, hmm, does the vaccine really work? Most vaccines do, none of them are perfect. Reason number six, um, profit motives in the vaccine industry. Um, plenty have um, thoughts. Uh, I get questions on occasion at the health department wondering about that. And distrust of government recommendations and then finally distrust of science in general or vaccine science in particular. So I will stop there and turn it over to Dr. Slovic. Well, uh, Pat did a good job of um, introducing my topic, which is to just to elaborate on why it is that uh, people might not want to vaccinate themselves or their children. And basically, I th uh, the, my main point is that deciding not to vaccinate, not to vaccinate, is very understandable from a psychological standpoint. And I'll illustrate why. But it's harmful to the community, and therefore presents a dilemma as to you know, what to, what to do about this. Um, so risk is a very hard thing to think about. It's, uh, it's not easy for us to, to uh, try to weigh be benefits and, and uh, harms in some way and come up with a decision. We usually, so we can think about risk in two ways. We can do it with our fast, intuitive gut feelings, or we could do, we could use kind of a more analytic approach where we look at uh, reasons, uh, evidence, science, uh, and so we've got both ways to deal with risk. And but mainly we use our gut feelings, unless we're uh, trained as a scientist and doing uh, research. Uh, we 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 trust our feelings to guide us, and our feelings are a very sophisticated. A way of dealing with the world. This is how we get through our word, our world, our day. Our feelings are our compass, and we 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 sense things intuitively and go with our gut. And it's very sophisticated. It usually works, but in some cases, those the feeling system uh, misleads us. And in particularly in situations of, of risk like this, we can be misled. And I'll try to illustrate um, why that might be. So think about cause-effect reasoning. So the, the, the timing of, of action and outcomes uh, is a cue to us as to what causes what. This is the way we learn how to control our world. We, you know, we learn you flip the light switch and the light goes on and you assume that that's, you caused the light go on, to go on and you probably did. And therefore you know that if you want the light to go on, you flip the switch. Supposing that you eat some uh, peanuts and you break out in a rash. Well, it's natural then to, to hypothesize that eating the peanuts caused the rash. And <clears throat> maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But the fact that you got a rash from after you ate the peanuts doesn't necessarily mean it was the peanuts that caused it. Maybe there was something else that uh, you were exposed to during the day that caused it. But, but so this sense of, of timing leads you to hypothesize that that was the cause. And that's a good start, but then it's not proof. To, to really prove that, that the peanuts caused your ra rash, you would have to do some testing. You'd have to maybe go to the doctor, get some uh, skin testing. And to prove that, not just for yourself, but for the community, you'd have to see that if, in general, people who eat peanuts are more likely to get rashes than not. So you'd have to do a community study. Well, that's what we do with, uh, with vaccines. So if you see an association, uh, a time, a, you know, a time-linked association between getting uh, vaccinated and a report of, of autism, then that's a that's a hypothesis that the vaccine causes cause autism, but it's not proof. To to prove it, you'd have to look at those people who are vaccinated. What's the incidence of autism? after vaccination and then uh, in the population that did not get vaccinated. Is there any difference? And that's what, what uh, science does. So cause and effect reasoning is, is, a, is a good, uh, these associations are good to, have, to generate hypotheses, but they don't prove that uh, uh, causality. You need, you need science to do that, and that's what medical science uh, does with regard to uh, vaccination. <clears throat> So another element that Dr. Lutke mentioned was the, the sense of benefit 
you know, do we really uh, benefit from vaccination? Would I benefit? And you know, as he mentioned, we don't see evidence of many of these diseases because vaccination has successfully reduced their incidence. So, so they're not they're not there. You know, uh, it doesn't seem that we really need to um, to uh, be vaccinated. Um, and the, and if we do get vaccinated, we don't know for sure that we were protected. We might not have gotten the disease anyway. So there's a strong tendency to kind of be a, a free rider. You know, maybe I won't need to do this. And um, and if enough people, other people are vaccinated, then the incidence will be low and I wouldn't need to have been vaccinated. So I can kind of ride on the decisions of others. And one can ask, well, is that really uh, a fair thing uh, to do? <clears throat> Another psychological factor that's very powerful is something we, we call the omission bias. We feel more responsible if we do something that leads to a bad outcome than if we don't do something that leads to that same outcome. Now again, it's a, it's a very uh, strong sense psychologically, but logically uh, it, it uh, is not so um, uh, reasonable. So, so for example, um, we, you know, we, we feel responsible and we regret uh, bad things that happens if we, if we uh, uh, if we acted rather than uh, we didn't act. And this is built in to a lot of our public policies. So for the, the way we evaluate uh, uh, medicines, if FDA evaluates medicines, is it's very cautious. You have to kind of prove through research that the benefits outweigh the risks. And, and medicines are kept off the market until there's sufficient proof that you've got this good benefit risk ratio, even though by keeping them off the market, you may be depriving people uh, who are in need of those medicines from access to it. And so there's often there's been fight about fights about uh, you know isn't it time to uh, release this and let people use it? Well, that's a very cautionary approach. It's that we don't want to do something that causes harm. We'd rather not give them the medicines and risk the harm than to give medicines that might be harmful. Uh, the same thing is built into our, our tort system. People are, are uh, uh, cri more criminally uh, vulnerable uh, as responsible if they have acted to cause harm than if the harm came from uh, failing uh, to act. Uh, same thing with regard to, say, something like assisted suicide. You know, the act of taking a life is seen as worse than uh, not acting and letting a person uh, die, even though there's a lot of... Um, of uh, uh, discomfort and, and harm to not uh, to, to prolonging their life. <clears throat> so this is a very powerful thing, the act versus omission type of bias that leads us to be reluctant to intr intrude upon a healthy individual with some agent that is related to a disease and in hopes that that will prevent their uh, getting, um, getting the disease. So these are a number of ways that we think about risk that lead us not to, uh, not to be vaccinated. Procrastination is another factor, of course. And the bottom line is that optim opting out of vaccinating, not vaccinating, is psychologically very understandable, but it increases the risk to the community. And so it's up to the community to decide how to deal with that and whether how much pressure to put on people to uh, get vaccinated or you know, how much uh, freedom to give people. And that's a community decision and that's a decision that we in every community is making. Thank you. I'm a little shorter. <laughs> Hi everyone. Today I'll be talking about vaccinations in relation to our school children and their families. As you know, school require, schools require certain vaccines by law for students to be able to attend. The requirements are updated yearly. A parent or guardian can request a copy of them from any school nurse or simply Google vaccine school requirements Oregon, which will bring you to the Oregon Health Authority's website and show you what's called a school bus flyer link. The vaccines required are listed by grade and are available in a few languages. Anyone needing translation to other languages can contact the school nurse who can connect them with a translator through the school district or the child's medical provider. 
It is important for families to communicate with schools about what vaccines their student has received. Most medical providers follow CDC guidelines regarding the vaccine schedule. This is updated yearly and can be found on the CDC website. You can Google CDC vaccinations or ask a school nurse for a copy. On this website, you'll also find links to vaccine information sheets in many languages that provide information about each vaccine. Typically, children receive a series of vaccines, first as a baby, then at the age of four to six prior to kindergarten, then again at age 11 to 12, and finally at 16 years old. Having regular well-child visits with the child's medical provider will help prompt a vaccine discussion and keep children on track with the recommended schedule. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends these well-child physicals yearly and most insurance companies will pay for this. Keep in mind there are CDC recommended vaccines that are not required by schools. I encourage families to talk with their providers about these as well, including a booster for the chickenpox vaccine, a meningitis vaccine, and the HPV vaccine series. College age students are at increased risk for meningitis. The CDC recommends the vaccine at age 11 to 12 and then again at 16 in preparation for reaching this age. Adolescents and young adults are at particular risk for human papillomavirus, which can cause cancer in both men and women. There are millions of cases reported to the CDC each year in this country. It is preventable with vaccination. According to state law, the public health department identifies a school exclusion date each year, usually in mid-February. This year's date is Wednesday, February 15th. On this day, if the school does not have documentation of a student having received the required vaccinations, the student will be excluded from school until such time as the family provides the vaccine dates. As you've heard, providers or families may choose not to vaccinate a child, which is called a medical or non-medical exemption. I'll talk about these in a minute. Families are notified by mail if the child is at risk of exclusion, usually in November. They may also receive phone calls from school health assistants and school nurses between December and February. This is why it's also important for families to notify schools of any address or phone number changes. Next, I'll talk about exceptions to the rules. Sometimes a medical provider will advise not to vaccinate due to a health condition. This is a medical exemption. Some examples may include severe illnesses or medical conditions that weaken a child's immune system, like respiratory infection or cancer. Recent medical treatments that affect a child's immune system, like blood transfusions or steroids. History of allergic or other serious reaction to a particular vaccine, pregnancy or breastfeeding. The provider may choose not to vaccinate at all, or may recommend delaying vaccination to a future date. Schools will need communication from the provider before excusing a student from this vaccine requirement. And I advise these families to speak directly with the child's school nurse so that he or she may communicate with the family during identified outbreaks of vaccine preventable illness in an effort to protect the student from exposure. A non-medical exemption, previously referred to as religious exemption, can be requested by families that choose not to vaccinate their children due to a personal or philosophical belief. The public health department and schools want to ensure that families are educated about the illnesses that vaccines protect against and are making an informed decision to not vaccinate. Interested families are now required to do one of two things. Talk to the child's medical provider who can educate the family and then sign a vaccine education certificate for the school. Or view an online video available on the public health website and print out a certificate for the school. You can Google Oregon vaccine exemption, which will get you to the public health website, which prompts to the modules. If you do not have access to a computer at home, you can notify the school and they can set you up with computer access at the school. Keep in mind that while children with non-medical exemptions can attend school, they may be excluded by school staff under the guidance of the public health department during times of vaccine preventable illness outbreaks or perceived outbreaks for the protection of the non-vaccinated child. I want to take a moment here to caution families doing a general web search on vaccines. You may encounter false information on websites that are not endorsed by the medical community at large. I recommend reputable websites like those for the Center for Disease Control or CDC, which links you to the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices or ACIP, the Oregon Health Authority, the Lane County Public Health Department, the Immunization Action Coalition, or IAC, which you can access on the World Health Organization's website, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine, or SAM, S-A-H-M, 
or ask someone in the medical field whom you trust, like the school nurse or a licensed medical provider in our community. There are some families in our community who may want to vaccinate their child but are experiencing barriers to care. I've addressed language barriers and access to information, but here are a few others. Lack of transportation to an appointment, parental obligations like work or family crises that prevent a parent or guardian from bringing a child to a medical appointment, lack of insurance coverage, maybe because someone in the family lost a job or the family just moved here from out of state or the child lacks documentation necessary for the application. Maybe you have insurance but have not yet been assigned a primary care provider and don't know where to go for care. I encourage any family experiencing these difficulties or others to contact a school nurse or health assistant who can help identify resources. It may be as simple as letting you know that the Oregon Health Plan pays for transportation to and from appointments. They may refer you to a safety net clinic like my two school-based health centers or the community health centers of Lane County that will see a child regardless of an inability to pay. In my health centers, I can vaccinate children who live in the 4J school district and are uninsured or have Oregon Health Plan coverage free of charge. This is supported by the state of Oregon through a federally funded vaccine for children program. If you live in the Bethel or Springfield districts, they also have school-based health centers that can provide this service. If a parent or guardian is unable to accompany a child to a medical appointment, Oregon law allows for children age 15 and older to sign for medical care themselves, including vaccination. For those children under the age of 15, I advise families to contact the health center and ask for assistance. Maybe a registration and vaccine permission form can be sent home for the guardian to complete and sign, and the provider can speak with the guardian over the phone to obtain and convey information. Also, school nurses may be able to connect families with transportation options through the school district to get the children to appointments. In conclusion, I want to discuss why vaccination is so important in our school settings. Our public health department has identified immunization as the safest and most effective public health tool available for preventing disease. Illness can be spread through poor hygiene practices, like not washing your hands thoroughly after using the restroom or before eating. And let's face it, children, as much as we love them, may not have the best hygiene skills yet. We work with them on that. Illness can be spread simply through sharing a space with someone who's sick and breathing those germs into the air. In schools, we have a lot of children and adults in a small amount of space, AKA the classroom or the hallway. These two conditions foster the spread of germs. Some of you parents, guardians, know exactly what I'm talking about. You may remember your own children coming home with various illnesses. Sometimes they're mild and quick. Sometimes they're much more severe. You've heard about some of these today. But children who come home sick are not only at risk for complications themselves, they can unintentionally spread illness throughout their families. This is particularly concerning in families with members who are more at risk, babies, elderly, or those with medical conditions that make their immune systems weak, like cancer. These children also go out into our greater communities to church, to stores, to playgrounds. Vaccinating children help keep them healthy and help keep our community healthy. We call this community immunity. And our community is not as isolated as in previous generations. We are part of a global community now where more and more people travel outside of our state, outside of our country. They're being exposed to illnesses that we may not have seen in a while here, and then they're returning home. Or people from around the globe are choosing to come here to visit or to live. We live in a pretty good town. Families that choose to vaccinate their children are giving this community a gift. They are taking part in the responsibility for the health of our society, the group we've chosen to live with, full of people of all ages, genders, race and ethnicities, multiple cultures, talents and abilities. They're who make our community special. Thank you for listening and thank you to the City Club of Eugene for having me today. Okay, so let's uh, wrap up the segment of formulating your questions so that we can take advantage of the speakers and uh, if they can we can get the speakers to come out and have a special chair and the special spotlight too maybe so the plan is that uh, the those of you who are going to be asking questions if you are directing it to somebody specifically then say so and uh, I will ask that person. If the other two are wanting to add to or respond to them, we'll have that time. The idea is to try to get as many questions as we can. 
Now, before we start the actual question and answer portion of this program, we wish to thank a few people for their recent donations. Ross Stein, William Powell, and Ruth Miller. Thank you for your generosity in supporting City Club of Eugene. Also, a special thank you to Mary Layton, who is stepping down from the board of directors to pursue further civic engagement. Mary has been instrumental, a volunteer on the board, who has hosted a number of book chats on behalf of City Club and facilitated a relationship with Lane County Econo Economy and Employment Course. Thank you, Mary, for your service. We wish you the best. Mary will continue to be a part of the fundraising committee. Mary, would you stand up for just one second? And I will sure keep an eye on you, Mary, as you will keep an eye on me, too, so. <laughs> All right, so, are we ready for the questions? Please, if you have a question, ask it right away. If I think you're making a big old statement, I'm gonna be the bad guy and say, cut it off, let's get to the question, okay? <laughs> and actually, one of our board members is gonna lead us with that example. Go ahead, Clay. Clay Stevens, City Club member since 2013. My question's for the whole panel. In, tw in 2015, California eliminated non-religious exemptions for all students wanting to go into public school or daycare. Uh, do you believe that Oregon both has the public support to follow California's lead, and also do you believe that this is a desirable step for Oregon? Thank you. Okay, who wants to go first? Start with the lady, and then go that way? Okay, good. That's the plan. You can go over to the microphone. we got to bring all these microphones down. Okay. That's a really good question to whoever um, put that forward. It's a challenging question to answer, and I'm going to refer a little bit to our culture here in Oregon, and we spoke a little bit about this earlier, that um, I think Oregonians are... are people that uh, really value um, independence and uh, decision-making. And so I talked a little bit in my talk about how you know, we want to make sure that if someone's choosing not to vaccinate, it's an informed decision. So I hesitate before you know, encouraging a law that, that takes away that ability for decision-making. Um, one of the things I mentioned in my speech too is that you know, choosing to vaccinate is, is a gift, you know, and so the more people that feel like they can do that, that values, but I'd, I'd hate to take that decision away from some people who feel strongly the other way. Patrick? I'm not convinced I have much of value to add. I would say, first of all, that I'm not aware of any data, Oregon specific, that says that we are ready for something like this. The two surveys that I spoke about that we in Lane County Public Health have done over the last five years did not ask that particular question. We asked about barriers to immunization. We asked about why they chose to be vaccinated or not. We asked the provider community, how hard is it to keep vaccines cold and in your freezers and refrigerators, those sort of things. So that's, that's one issue. Second, um, I do think that the states that had a law similar to what California just adopted um, over the last several years, Mississippi and West Virginia, I believe are the two states, um, they have very, very high vaccination rates um, amongst their children. Um, sadly, if you look at West Virginia, for example, after the elementary school years and into adolescence, their vaccination rates drop significantly. So um, it works really, really well when it's enforced, but as soon as it's not being enforced, you still have to have societal change and behavior change to, to keep those vaccination rates up high. Uh, and then finally, there are many ways to raise vaccination rates, and legal remedies are one of them, but there are others at education, advocacy, um, providing people access to health care through insurance. Um, those are other ways that can be quite helpful. And Paul? Okay, next question. Up. Hi, Ralph Pledger. I've been a member for a couple of months, and I'm asking a question for a guest. And I, I think it's addressed to everyone, basically. Can you address the concept of herd immunity in more detail? How does it work? Why are there documented cases of outbreaks in immunized communities, and yet herd immunity is still used as a reason to vaccinate? Okay, who's going first? So it's a really good question. Herd immunity or community immunity is something that many of us rely on. Um, and many people who cannot be vaccinated um, because their immune system, for example, might not be working, really are relying on us. And in essence, it gets to what um, in infectious disease epidemiology we call the reproduction number. 
or the R naught, R zero. What that number is, is it's a mathematical equation estimating how many new cases of a bacterial or viral infection will occur in a specific population. And it varies depending upon the particular microbe, the particular bacteria or virus. So by way of example, measles and whooping cough have a very high reproduction number. One case will cause 15 to 18 new cases. Influenza has a pretty low one. It's down around two or so. Uh, mumps is somewhere in between. It's five, five or six. And if you take the inverse of those numbers, um, that will tell you the percentage of the uh, public that needs to be vaccinated to prevent a massive outbreak. So, for example, um, for, mes or for measles or for whooping cough, when you're looking at a reproduction number of 15, 16, 17, 1 over 15 is about 94%. 94% of the population needs to be vaccinated to prevent a massive outbreak. And that's the community immunity part. That's why even though some of our vaccination rates amongst kids might be 90, 91%, and that's a lot of people being vaccinated, we're still not completely protected. We don't have the community immunity that we need to prevent a massive outbreak. Now, as I mentioned, there are plenty of vaccine preventable diseases that have a lower reproductive number, and we don't need to have 95% of people vaccinated to prevent an outbreak of that sort. But that's why we want to have rates as high as we're, we're trying to achieve. Patricia or Paul? No? Next question. It's become a lot easier for me to get my flu shot annually because I do it at the pharmacy at the grocery store. But I know that there is um, a prohibition against children being immunized in pharmacies, if I understand correctly. And I think there are good reasons for that. Our table made a, the point that insurance or lack of insurance would not uh, in allow lower income or uninsured children be to be immunized in any case. But I wondered if you how you felt about the possibility of increasing immunization rates by dropping the age limit for pharmacists to uh, immunize. Patricia, going first. So that's actually happened recently that now pharmacists um, here in Oregon can vaccinate as young as age seven. And I got a lot of calls when the law first came out from pharmacists just catching up on what it is we need to know when we're seeing children and talking to parents and working with families. And so I know I spoke to a number of them when that happened. I'm a mother of three. I, I took my own children to get their flu shots at the pharmacist. I thought he did a great job in educating me and them and um, none of them cried, yay, <laughs> so that was good. And I thought they did a great job. So I, I actually think that pharmacists providing vaccines is a good thing in our community. Okay, next question. The Robin Fletcher and I'm a city club member since 2004. And I was wondering more about to increase the flu shot, the flu immunization rate, what kind of marketing is being done or what should be done, do you think, to make it more common? All right. Anybody jump in at the same time? No? All right. Yeah. Uh, Paul Selby. Uh, I don't know what marketing is being done. I don't uh, see a lot of it. You see, you see uh, articles in the newspaper occasionally. Uh, about recommending uh, flu shots, but I, I think that uh, a lot more should be done given the low rate of uh, immunization against the flu and the reasons that we I uh, said that why it's understandable that people don't do that including just plain procrastination, but uh, I think that uh, that more could be done and, and should be done to point out the fact that uh, you know you have a you have a moral responsibility if uh, you know in addition to protecting yourself to protecting others because you're putting others at risk and and we know that for example that um, one of the things that really gave a boost to uh, uh, smoking from uh, restrictions on, on smoking was the discovery that uh, the smoker was not only harming themselves but was harming other people that you're uh, the secondhand smoke and and that's something that we rightfully recognize as less acceptable it's one thing what you do to yourself but what when you're exporting the risk to others who can't control that uh, that's really uh, not acceptable and I think we sh uh, more could be made of the fact that if you don't get vaccinated that you are putting others uh, others at risk so that's just one example and then there's very many ways there are different ways that you can express the risk or if you, you have testimonials of people who say oh I decided not to get a, a flu shot this year 
and I got a really bad case. I was out of action for three weeks. I wish I had gotten my shot. Things, testimonials like that could also uh, help. So I think much more uh, uh, could and should be done in that regard. Okay, let's add more. Go ahead. I'll add one point. Um, there are, again, possible opportunities for uh, rule changes or statute changes. We have a statute, uh, I believe it's ORS 433.416, that says that in this state we cannot mandate vaccination, for example, amongst healthcare workers, of anything that's not recommended by the federal government. So we cannot mandate that healthcare workers have a flu vaccine in order to take care of people in the hospital or urgent care or clinics or even at an assisted living facility. Uh, and many states have entertained um, laws of that sort to say, look, if you're going to take care of potentially um, fragile people, um, it'd be good to not infect them with something that you have. Uh, right now, we can't do that in Oregon. All right, next question. Paul Thompson, a City Club member. <clears throat> and this uh, question was formulated by our distinguished journalist from Flux magazine over here. And it's directed to Dr. Lutke and to uh, Ms. Schaffner. If you encounter an individual who has availed themselves of all of the sources of information that you described, Mrs. Schaffner, and that person is still convinced that they should not get their child vaccinated, do you actively try to change their mind? And if so, what mechanism do you, do you use to try to do that? Okay. <laughs> Who's going first? Patricia. <laughs> Okay, so as you can imagine with the rates that we have here in Oregon of not vaccinating, I do see that in my own practice. And, yeah, it's fine. It's you know, fine. I, I talked a little bit about vaccine information sheets from the CDC. I usually will ask those parents to take them home. So I, I give my whole spiel, kind of like what you heard a little bit up there on, on why I think it's important. And I, I literally go through every vaccine and every illness that it protects with them, just explaining in what I hope to be um, a respectful way. And then if they choose not to, I ask them to take those sheets home and to, to consider uh, researching a little more from the CDC. But I do respect people's right to decide. And then I turn to the child and I say, you know the number one way to keep yourself healthy is washing your hands, and washing your hands for a long time and really well. And so not only when you come out of the bathroom, a lot of kids know that, but before you're gonna eat and when you get home from school, so all those germs you have out in public, you know, not bringing those into your home. So that's a little bit of how I handle it in my practice. Okay, uh, ready for the next question? Go ahead. Uh, John Doyle, City Club member, and in our discussion at the table was that there are some, there seem to be some healthcare people uh, that are actually against vaccinations. Do you find anything, any uh, people in your professions that are uh, anti-vaccine or have you heard of any of that all right so wholesale anti-vaccine as in against all vaccines I'm not aware of anyone I know that there are certain people who are wondering about select vaccines so for example some years ago if you recall we had a vaccine for rotavirus um, against children and some of the safety data showed that, you know, maybe it wasn't quite as safe as we wanted it to be. Ultimately, it was pulled from the market um, because the safety data was not as good as it should have been. So it, at least in the circles that I run in, I'm not aware of a healthcare worker who has a license to provide some form of healthcare um, in Oregon that's wholesale against all vaccines. But again, I, I don't run in all the circles. And Patricia? I'm just going to add quickly that I too do not know of any medical professional that doesn't support vaccination and in fact I met a doctor a couple of years ago who practices up in Washington State and he actually will not allow you to be in his practice if you're not going to vaccinate for him you know he says everyone's welcome unless you're not going to vaccinate because he because he feels so strongly for it okay next question I'm Jack Dresser. I've been a, a member for a couple of years. Um, this is from our table. Uh, uh, you know, I, I started my career as a psychologist uh, with a five-year postdoc at the Kennedy Child Study Center, you know, studying lots of complicated neurological issues, uh, including autism and so forth. Autism, for example, was an extremely... Ext Okay, well, it was an extremely rare disorder. 
it has grown exponentially since then. I know the diagnostic criteria have changed. I know this is a complicated research issue. But the objections to vaccines are not entirely irrational. So what is the question, please? What, you have a well, my question is, I, I would like people on the panel to discuss something called the Federal Vaccine Court that has been kept secret from the public and also grants immunity to the manufacturers for, for harms caused by vaccines. Okay. Thank you for the question, panelists. Do you have an answer for that? Can you go first, Paul? So, Patrick? I, um, I don't know that it was kept secret. I mean, I knew about it before I was a physician. Um, and anyone today can log on and see the vaccine side effect data from the CDC. Any typical year, there's 20,000 or so people who say, you know, my arm hurt afterwards. 90 plus percent of those are pretty minor. They're like pain at the side or redness at the side or a little bump at the side of the injection. Uh, some of them are serious, and, and that's true. Um, and I think it would be scientifically um, perhaps even if not welcome, perhaps a crime to not do post-marketing survey. And that's what this is all about. You do post-marketing surveillance. And the way that we bring products to market in this country does not involve 50 years of research and testing it on multiple species and then testing it on multiple humans and then eventually rolling it out. We try to bring it out more quickly. Um, and part of that is you bring out a product that may not be perfect and you have to do post-marketing assessment and evaluation. And that's what we do in this country. I think we do it pretty well. We probably do it the best on the planet. Many countries are looking to us how it is we follow up after vaccines and the issue around um, providing some coverage for lawsuits to the pharmaceutical business uh, you know you could have a philosophical um, choice or philosophical bent to say that's absolutely wrong in all cases or you could look at what we do for almost every other industry in this country and we provide plenty of backup to the oil industry and, and the agricultural industry and others because we know that it's important to have three meals a day on our on our um, plates for our kids every year and we do that by paying for crop insurance for bad years for the agricultural industry. I think we do it everywhere. Um, in some ways it's good business, in some ways it ensures that other aspects of our health are taken care of. Okay, so we're ready for the next question. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, mine is about um, ethics and morality um, and the lack thereof in the pharmaceutical industry. Their bottom line is the dollar. and. Um, several top medical professionals have come out to talk about um, how it's hard, it's no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that's published and to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians and authoritative medical guidelines. And this is a quote from Dr. Marsha Angel. So, you have a question? Yes, so several, you know, several high up medical professionals have had concerns with the data that's coming out and the, the conflict of interest. There are several whistleblowers at Merck and at the CDC and there's lawsuits and um, about conflicts of data and um, I'm wondering how you use that and how much you research that to um, you know make your medical your professional opinions and recommendations. Thank you. Okay, who wants to go first? I don't have a good answer to that. I know that conflict of interest is a, a very big topic these days, in, not only in medical science, but in all areas of science. Con uh, conflict of interest, uh, fraudulent uh, data reporting or, or practices that uh, that to kind of are biased to find what you're looking for to begin with, or or not to find that. So uh, this is a, this is an issue that uh, that all of uh, the science community is is aware of. Uh, uh, journals are getting very strict in terms of of um, having you fill out conflict of interest uh, forms when you submit something for publication. Uh, I think we we need to do that. It's being done, and hopefully that will will uh, you know minimize this this problem. Thank you, Patrick or Tricia. Anything to add? I think I would say while pharmaceutical companies are businesses and their leaders are looking at that bottom line, I think that the research that's happening in them are done by scientists, and I have to hope that, like myself that they are conscientious about the work that they do. Another thing is that multiple pharmaceutical companies are often producing vaccines 
for the same illness. And so we get the benefit of seeing how different products can work. And I know that the federal government is looking to that and they make guidelines based on which products are working better and what they're seeing. And I also would like to trust in the government that when things come up that, that don't seem kosher, that don't seem right, that they're gonna do the right thing and investigate it and make sure that, that it's made right. Thanks. Okay, we have time to one more question, maybe two. Hello, my name is Mariah Learn, and this question is from my table, um, directly to the doctors. Um, what do you think of the shed concept of shedding? Um, that is one, maybe you can explain what that is exactly. And uh, for me personally, I, I had a very bad experience uh, with um, um, my family who needed to get, was told they needed um, um, vaccines for a particular program. I was a little bit resistant and I went ahead and spent my own money for titers, titer tests. Turns out that he didn't need a couple of these tests, but he needed, they, they demanded that he have these, 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 these vaccines anyway. Thank okay. you. You can address that, address that. Thank you. Who wants to go first? Patrick, can you do that? You take that so away. before the questioner disappears, when you were talking about shedding, were you meaning such as viral shedding, where you shed the virus, it's inside of you, and you continue to shed it for some time? Or are you talking about something other than that? I believe that was it from, from people who've had live vaccines, that, that, that it can be shed and other people get it. That was my understanding of the question. Yeah. So there are some vaccines that are live. Uh, the measles vaccine is a live virus vaccine. Rubella is, mumps is. Um, a large number of our vaccines are not live virus vaccines. Uh, the influenza vaccines that we have on the market this year, none of them are, are live. Um, so when you do get a vaccine that happens to be alive, it's typically what we call attenuated or weakened might be a better word. It can cause an infection uh, and allows your immune system to make an antibody to respond to it. Um, but it typically doesn't cause the same infection, like if it was a weakened polio virus, uh, back when we used live polio, um, it wouldn't cause the paralysis. So um, the live influenza vaccine we had for some time caused a mild infection, but it could not survive deep into the lungs, so it only caused an infection high up into your nasopharyngeal area, and you didn't end up getting the bad side effects. So when you do have those infections that are caused by this weakened virus, you can shed it for a while. People with polio can shed the polio virus in their, in their stool for some time, and then potentially it can get out into the community. Um, however, it's a weakened virus, and it's not going to go out and cause paralysis. Um, so I'm not convinced I answered your question. It, the Probably one other issue that you're alluding to is that some people who have a weakened immune system, they can be infected for a longer period of time, and we try to make sure that we don't give them live vaccines. Um, same reason we try not to give live vaccines to pregnant women, um, because their immune system may be attenuated for a time. Before we thank our guests today, there are a few quick announcements. Thank you, Wild Time Foods and Whit uh, Helmfield for hosting this week's meeting at the Lane Workforce Partnership, Lane County Economic and Employment course. This course helps teachers become familiar with local businesses in order for high school students to identify potential jobs after graduation. The City of Eugene also wants to thank our sponsors, including the Voss Cobb Attorneys, KPFF Consultant Engineers, and Gators Turnside and Bothrop attorneys. To KLCC 89.7 FM radio for airing our programs every Monday at 6.30 in the evening, and community television for broadcasting our programs Monday to Friday at noon and Saturday and Sunday. And of course, to our host, the Baker Center, for hosting us every Friday. Next week, uh, February 3rd, the program is Eugene Parks and Recreation the present and future of our greatest natural asset. Additional information about our future programs and membership at www.cityclubofeugene.org. Please join me in thanking uh, Patrick Ladicki, uh, Tricia Schofner, and Paul Slovic for bringing clarity to this topic. Thank you so much for being today. My name is Juan Carlos Valle, and this concludes today's program.